I grew up from the time I was born in and on small boats on the water. So it's a very familiar thing to me and it's a very familiar view of Bermuda, the view from the water going along the shore, poking around and that sort of thing. When you're on the water, you observe so much, you see so many things and you're more in tune with the natural environment, you know, in a boat without a motor. I think it was an American writer once said that the value per foot of a small boat that you get out of it is just colossal compared to the larger boats that stay on the moorings. When you're going along in a boat, there are so many factors coming into play, especially if it's a wooden boat, it will have its own personality and characteristics. Your boat is what is between you and the water. In some cases, that's a life and death thing. So you have to take care of your boat. Your boat takes care of you. If you talk to these older guys, they have a relationship with their boat, the same way a lot of the fishermen have a deep relationship with their prey. You know, you really want to understand some things, and your boat is one of them. <laughs> Be fish and taters every single day. They used to sing and dance as they went along, singing a happy but a teasing kind of song. Ha ha ha, yeah, man. I think there are quite a lot of people who may not have a connection to the Bermuda environment, who find that getting out in small boats is a great way of getting to know Bermuda, especially the maritime environment. It's like getting your bike when you're 16. The whole new world opens up to you. You know, you're free to go on the watery part of our home. My name is Jane Downing. I work at the National Museum of Bermuda, formerly the Maritime Museum. And my lifelong deepest interest is in small boats. So over the years, I've spent a lot of time in small boats. And I've spent a lot of time talking about the use of small boats in Bermuda. I grew up in Tortured Bay. We lived on the water, so we played in the water. Loved to explore. We made a few little punts here and there where boards and whatnot permitted, and started out kind of there. And somehow or other, I just absorbed an interest in boats. I'm Anson Nash. Right now, I work with the Department of Conservation Services as a marine ecological technician. I ran a restoration workshop in the evenings at the Maritime Museum. But I don't actually build boats professionally. Um, it's more of on the side. I first got interested in them just, I guess, through my father, and then gradually acquainted myself with tools and materials and how they work. And light bulbs turn on. And, and I did some repair work here and there, repaired masts, started making masts, helped some fishermen down the road with their boats and whatnot. And building boats over the years has kind of added up. In 1991, Anson Nash and I decided to interview the remaining people we could find who had worked or used small boats in Bermuda um, without engines. And I think we interviewed about 15 people. And they had worked in all sorts of areas, from building boats to 
piloting, fishing, muscle dredging, and we talked to a lot of these guys and asked a lot of details about how they operated their gear and, you know, the whole process of what they did, how to haul a pot under sail, how they came to be working in boats. If you can trace your roots back into the 19th century, chances are that members of your family worked on the water. An awful lot of people lived this pluralistic lifestyle that consisted of farming, fishing, piloting when they could get a chance, salvage when they could get a chance, and all of these actually involved boats, including the farming, because produce was shipped to St. George's on freight boats and stone was cut and loaded onto boats. So you see shoreside quarries. So a huge number of people depended upon boats and maritime occupations. There's been quite a few boat builders since the Navis, and most people use a common law since the Navis to have a boat built. My name is Warren Fogo, but everybody knows me by Mickey. My occupation is carpentry. My main thing is boat building and furniture and that sort of thing. I've been building boats since I was 13 years old. That's when I built my first boat, 12 feet. My first boat I built was 12 feet, V-bottom dinghy. I named it Iona after my mother. Yeah, she was proud of that. <laughs> I've built sailboats for people that want to race, and I've built boats for guys that fish for a living, plus pleasure boats. I've been into it for over 50, 55 years. So I've built quite a few sailboats, and every time I built one, I got better and better until I got to the stage that I am now. The thing I've discovered mostly with the research is the beauty and the simplicity of, of the rig and the working of the dinghies. The smaller dinghies evolved from ship's boats and the sails were simple, initially made out of sack bags from flour, hand-stitched if they didn't have a much sewing machine. And the rig was beautiful, a little jib and a main sail. The main was laced to the mast and the canvas was lovely and worked well. They're a pretty craft, and the exercise is good. You can get from A to B and have fun and pleasure. With reasonable care, a good wooden boat built with modern methods will last. If you look at the traditional plank on frame boats, they had the beauty if you damaged a plank, you could pop it off that section and replace it. And they were infinitely repairable in that regards. So you can have a boat that could be 300 years old. Some of it might not be original, but the name is there and the shape is there if they've been faithful restoring it and uh, rebuilding it. And that's the nice thing about the plank on frame boats, you can do that. In the research I've done so far, I've found that most of these boats were used for many purposes. They were simultaneously used for all kinds of things. And often, you know, they changed uses over the course of their life. So a boat that may have started life as a British officer's racing yacht might end up as a freight boat or a fishing boat or a pilot boat. If you're thinking about types of boats that were traditionally used in Bermuda, very basically you've got three sort of prototypes. One is a dinghy of 13 to possibly as long as 18 feet. Another is the pilot gig, the gigs that were used for piloting, which were much, much longer. You know, they could be 40 feet in length, very narrow, rowed by eight men or capable of being rigged with two sails. And then the third type would be the Bermuda sloop, meaning the locally used sloop, rather than the ocean-going sloop, which is a completely different thing.
So there are quite a few dinghies around. Most of them are sort of remains rather than entire boats, you know, but you'll see them all around. You can look at boats from different areas and see subtle differences, but they all have the same rough proportions. I don't think too much was done in terms of locale evolving the shapes on the design of boats and dinghies. It was more usage. I mean, the gigs were long because it was faster. The pilotage fee was shared amongst the crew. So when the fee depended on being able to get your pilot aboard first, if you got there second, it didn't count. You expended an awful lot of effort for virtually nothing. So you had that long length. And the eight or gigs were faster than the sixes, and the ten or gigs were faster than the eights. The only design aspect that seemed to come from here was the rig. In the Bahamas, you had a simple mainsail on the dinghies, no jib, and the winds here, you didn't have a strong trade wind like they do in the Bahamas, blowing almost year-round. Most of the dinghies with Meridian rig, especially the turtle dinghies, were used in the summer months, and winds were lighter here in the summer, so they needed a little bit more area. A mast much more than 18 feet is a little unwieldy when you wrap sail around it and try and unstep it and lower it down. So with Meridian rig, they would favor using a jib. And this is the working dinghy rig, which was the beautiful, simple one. And with a, a reasonably rake mast, it went well to windward. So they were able to fine down the bows a bit to get a bit more speed and make them easier to pull through the water, whether it be by sculling oar or sail. The locally used sloops were usually probably 20 to 30 feet long. Some were smaller, and they had a single mast. They had what's known as a leg of mutton sail, which could be adjusted, and it was the same on the dinghies as well, that evolved to suit the Bermuda circumstances. Because of the way the island is situated, you know, on a northeast-southwest angle, we have prevailing southwesterly winds. You're predominantly sailing either before the wind or into the wind, into the wind being the more difficult part. So the better your boat can do that, then you know the faster you're going to get where you want to go. So this is an example of where the Bermuda rig with the triangular sail is very weatherly. It goes very close to the wind when it's going to windward. It's always interesting to try and see what might have been characteristically Bermudian about something that is part of our past. With boats, it's quite hard to tell specifics because there aren't a lot of examples around. There aren't a lot of plans or models, and there's not a lot of descriptive material about Bermuda boats unless they're racing. Also, given Bermuda's role as a way station in the North Atlantic, it's difficult to know what the external influences on Bermuda boat design would have been, because boats were constantly arriving in Bermuda via shipwreck, via visiting ships. Whale ships came to Bermuda. And then in the 19th century, with the dockyard, a lot of work boats and, and naval boats were coming into Bermuda. So there was this constant influx of boats from elsewhere, and there was probably a lot of tweaking with boat shape along the way. And there's no doubt that Bermudians would have adapted things to their particular circumstances. It used to be at one time I could tell you what boat it was, what size, who designed it. Now I look at a boat and I go, I, I, don't, I don't know this boat. 
in boat building terms, really we haven't had much of a serious boat building industry for a cruising sailboat since the 70s. I think that as times change, you'll see more foreign influence and less Bermuda influence just simply because we can't keep up with the, A, the affordability of building boats and B, the people that'll want them. Well, my name is Steve Hollis. I own Ocean Sails. I've owned Ocean Sails since 1980. And I grew up sailing. All my siblings sailed. So we all grew up racing and sailing, and it was the thing to do in the summer back then. I started in the sailmaking business when I was 13, working with Jay Hooper in Hamilton, and progressed from there. I decided at an early age that uh, because I loved sailing so much, I loved the actual sailmaking art side of sailing as well. So Jay took me in when I was 13 as an apprentice, untangling rope, unpicking, stitching, doing all the grunt work, sweeping floors. But I knew that I loved the whole process. We don't really have Bermuda design and built boats except for some of the dinghies. Certainly the Bermuda fitted dinghy is a Bermuda boat. I was involved in two fitted dinghies that Geordie Walker built designed the rigs and designed and built all the sails for Spirit of Bermuda, which sailed out of the Maritime Museum. And then Geordie, uh, Blair Simmons and I built Bloodhound, which was the second fitted dinghy that Geordie had designed himself. And again, you know, built the hull, the sails, and put the whole program together as, as far as sailing it. And probably sank more than anybody else ever in the history of dinghy racing, but it was a lot of fun and uh, a good experience for me. This is my property yourself tour. I have a couple of uncles that was into boat building. We used to build a lot of sailboats and uh, motorboats. Boat building is completely different from just, just carpentry. It's a very unique thing. There's all kinds of bands that you have to make and angles. And sometimes to get a real sharp band, you have to steam the material to get it to go around. Sometimes I have to make up a steam journey to get to steamy material so it will bend easy. It's very unique. I used to use a marine ply. It was all built out of 3.8 marine ply. And the bigger boats was built out of spruce, plank boats with spruce. You don't see anybody bringing in that type of material anymore. There's not too many people building boats these days. They have gotten rid of all the old wooden boats and going into fiberglass. In the 19th century, small Bermuda boats were described as being built of cedar. And cedar is quite light. You're going to get a little bit more buoyancy. But I think there was also fairly extensive use of other woods which came from overseas because a lot of the boats that have survived are not built of cedar. But certainly the weight of the wood makes a big difference. Traveling in heavier weather, a lot of times you have to deal with a lot of chop and the need for buoyancy in the bow area and, and all that sort of thing. But the heavy, heavy boats will range further because they carry their momentum along for quite a distance. This boat I have here, the Iona, all our framework is all Bermuda cedar. I use quite a, quite a bit of cedar. Cedar would outlast anything around here, yeah. She had a cedar stern, and most of the interior was cedar but all the outside and the hull is all planking with spruce. Spruce would last a fairly long time in salt water, but cedar would last you a lifetime, actually. Like, there's no end to it, you know. It's just 33 years old now. You probably could get another 30 years if you know, it was taken care of. It's just been a very good boat. It brought me back every time. <laughs> The 
the parts of a boat. You have the stem, which is the vertical piece there, and at the other end you have a transom. Generally a boat is erected on a backbone or keel. This would be your, your center line or in a fitted dinghy, the keel line. The dinghy guys favored smaller trees with natural crooks or bends for the timbers. The cedar trees and their size, the bigger the trees, the bigger the ships. Obviously having trees that grew in plenty of soil with good moisture and if they were crowded, in other words the spacing of the trees were together, uh, they would tend to grow tall and straight without too many branches which would be suitable for planking, whether it be a ship or a dinghy. Toward the end of the 1700s, Bermuda became very famous for schooners. And the Royal Navy actually ordered a lot of schooners from Bermuda when they first came to check Bermuda out. And the jib-headed sails would have been quite characteristic of Bermuda boats. Most of the fittings on these small boats were wooden because, of course, a manufactured piece of hardware is an expensive item and it's much easier to make your own little rings to feed your ropes around objects rather than a little pulley, or to use wooden pins instead of metal row locks for rowing. And what we found was that they had improvised and reused and invented different ways to produce the gear that they needed or different parts of the boat. And it just re-emphasized the need for resourcefulness when you're living on a rock in the middle of the ocean with almost no natural resources at all. The need to be as resourceful as you can with what you're able to lay your hands on. Over the years you learn the shortcuts, you learn how to do things better, you learn what works here, and that's what we look at. We look at efficient ways to do things, better ways to do things to suit our climate. When I started, it was an old cut and try method of sail making. And basically, if somebody did a really nice sail, you might take it right apart and copy it. So you'd mark out the same thing and then see how much shape they put in, because sail is actually a cambered shape, like a wing. So what would happen back then, you'd come up with a fast design, and then if somebody wanted a, a larger sail, you'd try to project that smaller design into a larger one, but it didn't always work. But then in 1977, Jerry Milgram from uh, MIT did a paper on analytical sail design. Fabulous designer, sailor, and he was my first introduction into analytical design. Now, we go to a boat, measure the rig, and the sail's designed specifically to that rig, and we went over the years doing different sails for all sorts of different boats, the Bermuda dinghies, small boats, then the offshore boats here, and we've built sails for all sorts of boats all over the world. So it's uh, been a pretty fascinating experience. And I was lucky enough to come up in an analytical age where we took sail design from cut and try to analytical. I wanted to have a boat to go fishing. Rather than fish off the rocks, I'd go out to fish. And that's what it enticed me to build this boat. It's a V-bottom fishing boat, displacement hull. There's different hull shapes. You can have a displacement hull or a planing hull. A displacement hull would have a deep V and a deep forefoot forward. And planing hull would be more flat at bottom. Something that would give you more speed. So a planing hull will be more sufficient for racing, and displacement hull is more stable in the water. This is a half model of a uh, fitted dinghy. The shear line runs from the stem to the transom, and it's this profile. 
and generally it's a matter of trying to get into a nice sweet curve with no bumps or lumps. That line on a plan profile is that shape and it's the same line. If you get those two merged well, you get a really pleasing shape no matter how the boat is healed. And that little pencil line was kind of the designed water line when she was sailing with crew. From my understanding, the early boats were very full bowed. In other words, the planks came around and almost met flat at the stem and they were wide and had relatively broad transoms. When they became a little bit shaky, they would rebuild them. And sometimes they would take off the stem and put a much longer raking stem and plank to that. Sometimes they would take off the transom and extend the planks back and giving a counter with a very small transom. And that gave you the same waterline length when going slow, but when the boat healed under sail, it gave you an increased waterline length and made her faster. And they were really wholesome, lovely little boats. Thirty years ago, we could be competitive on the world market with sails. We could design and build a sail here, and it would be cheaper to do that than to import a sail. When I started, we had even canvas and cotton sails that we worked on, which was a whole different field, and it's a lost art. Then it went to terylene, or what we know today as Dacron, and then that's when, for sail making, it changed a lot for us because as the fabrics changed, the designs changed, now we had to be a lot closer on your design. It was a faster cloth, so it's less stretch in the fabric. So in were coming the mylars, the racing fabrics, the ones that don't let any air through them, basically. So the manufacturers were putting out different cloths all the time, and it became apparent in about the 80s that we really couldn't be competitive anymore building sales here. So we couldn't keep up with the technology. And for us as a small company doing, you know, maybe 50, 60 sales for big boats a year, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't compete. So we got into rigging a few years ago pretty heavy and have done some big boats. We've done big catamarans and a lot of the visitors that come here will troubleshoot and replace rigging and uh, do whatever. It's part and parcel with the whole what makes a boat go. You know, you need rigging for sails. And we've been into rigging for a long time. I love going up mass. I love sitting up there at 100 feet and just working and looking around and it's an awesome feeling. But I'm looking for a boat that's going to be nice to look at and a boat that's going to perform good in the ocean. Something that's going to be comfortable, that won't be too cranky, that's what it should be. So something that you figure that's going to be very comfortable on the water, any idea. I make flotation models. So then I proportionally ballast them with weight of engine, weight of fuel, and passengers, and tow them to see how they perform. One tweaks them, makes another one if the first one doesn't work out, and gradually work up to a shape. And the building process implements that shape the best you can. It can be exciting, but it doesn't happen on its own. And uh, no matter how good your imagination is, you can't make the work happen. It's a matter of just uh, taking a saw and, and starting the cut. And hope you've marked it well. And if you get it right, it works. And it's great. Analytical design nowadays is all computerized. 
and today a guy sits on a computer, designs your sale, it then goes to a plotter on a big table that plots the design shape into the fabric and all of the fabric is cut by a laser so there's no heat sealing the edges and then it's stuck together with double-sided tape. Modern sails are glued and basically stitched up and then the finished product. So you can almost be guaranteed today that you'll have a pretty perfect end result. Across the board, almost every sail maker will do a pretty nice sail, but the bigger guys with the research and development teams can actually tweak them and do much better. So what we did in 1985, we went searching for a worldwide sailmaker with a good reputation that would build us good sails because I've always been a stickler for detail and strength. So for us to survive, we went overseas and said, okay, we'll do all the measuring, the specking for the boat, and you build our sails for us so we can still remain competitive in, in a market and still sell and do what we do. So I think that was probably the one thing that enabled us to even stay in business. So changing the business in that respect uh, allowed us to maintain who we were and still continue on in the sail making business. I was one of the first group to go overseas to represent Bermuda in the Commer class. It was a very good experience. I've competed in quite a few races, and now I won one, <laughs> but I've came close to winning. We used to have the wooden boats. So I wasn't really for going into the fiberglass. A lot of these guys here that were sailing the comets, and they couldn't afford to go that far. So I built 27 of them. They buy the material, I built it for them for nothing, you know, just so that they could get out there and sail and have fun and which we used to have a lot of fun. We used to sail every weekend, every Saturday, every Sunday. But once they decided to go into the fiberglass boats, the boys, they just couldn't compete with that there. You know? They couldn't afford it. So that's why they all got out of it. During the mid 20th century, there was this big boom in home boat building and it was sweeping the United States, England and Bermuda was reflected in this huge quantity of magazines that came out all about, you know, how to build your own boat. They had plans in them. A lot of Bermudians built their own boats at that point that weren't necessarily traditional in their construction or their appearance, but there was a big boom in that. And these were cabin cruisers and that sort of thing. And definitely are quite a lot of them still around. There probably are various economic facets to why there aren't perhaps more boats around and currently being built. It's very expensive to build them and they require care and maintenance. You can't let them go the way you would let a fiberglass boat go. But I think it is a matter of pride for people that do have traditional boats. There's a certain amount of prestige attached to having a boat like that. For example, I've heard a lot of people say they wish they had a Gary Pitcher dinghy, but whether anybody could make it work economically is another question altogether. One nice thing is with the Round the Island Seagull race, it spawned the building of all kinds of boats. Some a little scary. They got longer, narrower, lighter, and scarier. But racing is racing. Gary Pitcher, the last guy building dinghies in St. David's, he had a bandsaw and a table saw, you know, a lot of hand tools and his shop was just full of cedar and dust and, and shavings and congested, but he was a neat old guy who fished and he had a garden, farmed and he made dinghies. The sun is your biggest damage maker for anything. The ultraviolet rays break down the yarns, hence break down the sails. 
Stitching is usually the first to go. And in today's world, every time you go sailing, you gotta look for chafe, you gotta make sure the things are all right, and that's part of the whole sailing game. A set of cruising sails, one would expect if you take care of them, 10 years heavy cruising. A weekend sailor, you could get 15 years. Modern sail-wise, I'm finding that even big cruising sails that are done with modern fabrics, laminates and stuff, five years at the maximum they're getting out of these before they start costing them more money than it's worth. The modern fabrics, you know, the mylars with carbon fiber in them, they break down in different ways. So in the modern fabrics, it's more of a delamination issue because they use glues and it depends on how the fabric is glued. And once they delaminate, they're done. If you get into the racing market, usually one season and they'll replace the sails. And those are the costly ones. So they're spending a fortune every year on sales. So it's good to bring them in and have them go over them because we'll find things that the average person wouldn't even know what to look for. And a little bit of preventive medicine will save them a huge bill in the end. I have a fiberglass boot knob. It's less maintenance. That's the beauty part of it, buddy. Take it out of the water, you have to just power wash your bottom and buff your sides up and put it back. Wooden boot, you have to power wash your bottom, sand it, paint it, and all kinds of things. Every year, every year you have to do something, do repairs, sand it down and painting, and now and then there's something else, probably rot it out, and has to be patched up and all. Which you didn't have that problem with a fiberglass boot. It's a lot less maintenance. I mean, the younger ones, if they could get away from just buying a boot and going home for it, it's a good thing, but they could try to put their hands to something to, to see if they could create something. Yeah. If you do the work yourself, the traditional built plank on frame hole, I always kept her wet. In other words, if I took her up, it didn't bring her up for more than two weeks for painting and get her back down. If you kept her up, she would open up and create problems. Basically, the wood wouldn't necessarily warp, but it would shrink. So all your caulking would come loose and some people would re-caulk. And what happens is after a period of years, the planks get narrower and narrower and narrower with a complete seasonal compression and a shrinking. And it would wreck havoc with the boat. And having to hire somebody to do a repair on a wooden boat is cost prohibitive. To me, being in business is to know that in the world, you're looked at as one of the best. And that comes from bringing the old school sail making into modern day awning making. So we changed the business quite a lot here. Got heavier into canvas, boat covers, awnings, and then upholstery. And that was the interesting thing about this business in general is that we have to change and evolve all the time. It's not the same old, same old. To be able to compete and stay alive in this world, you have to change, which in this trade is very difficult today. More and more throughout the world, you're finding the small lofts like us totally disappearing, and it's a shame. I would hate to think that sail makers didn't exist in Bermuda in another 40 years when there's still the opportunity and there's still boats passing through and people here sailing but there's also nobody else coming in to fill our shoes, and that's the biggest shame. I think the use of boats has changed phenomenally from having to earn a living or for delivering a pilot to a gig or from pure transport to pleasure and racing. So I think in a way, the emphasis now is on recreation, whether it be rowing or just chilling out in a boat, enjoying the environment in a way. 
for having just fun on the water and exploring and being able to enjoy the harbors and bays and have fun. I've met all kinds of people that is into the boat building and I've left here going to the U.S. to do interior of boats. I also cater to all the yachts that come here that helps repairs, that gets damaged in bad weather. I've built spars for them, wooden spars, and done interior repairs and rebuilt new hatches for them and all sorts of repairs. Repairing is just exciting, you know, because you have to have the knowledge of building something to repair something. At one time a yacht came in here, she had damage to her port side and I had to do it overboard, you know, replace some of her planks while she was in the water. That was a very challenging job. I was able to do it while she was in the water. So it's a quite a challenge in so many jobs that I have to do, you know. There are some things that uh, you can't learn from a book. You can only learn by exposure to and some guidance from someone who has mastered that. There's a lot to be learned from traditional crafts that has to do with patience and understanding your materials and your tools and I think it's that whole thing of actually working with tangible materials. And this job is for anybody, anybody can do it. It is a fascinating job. If I'm looking for somebody that I think is interesting and I'm always looking, I'll hire a Bermudian if they come in and they show interest. I want a Bermudian to come in. The knowledge that I've gained, I can pass it on. Somebody coming into it's got to be outgoing, got to want to seek knowledge. You learn the tools that you need for the job as you do the job. So good with your hands and not afraid to work, which I think is the one thing that we look for. But there are no Bermudians at this time coming in after me. There's just nobody out there. And it's sad. My favorite part is just coming to work every day. <laughs> Working with who I work with, I work with my wife. She's been my partner for 16 years. The staff are great, they have fabulous customers. For me, it's been a fascinating ride the whole time. It's never a tall moment. This type of business makes you think. It makes you really have to use your brains and your hands and your skills. It's a lifestyle. You're not going to get rich doing this. You know, if you want to make big money, then you'll have to go and get a job in an exam company, but you can have a great time. I learn something every day, and I think that's what makes this job, to me, the most fascinating job there is. I mean, this has been my life's passion, and uh, it is what, what I do well. There are a lot of guys who have gone abroad and studied boat building and could do it, but I don't think the money's there. And you often find these guys restore boats because it's more profitable to run a boat yard and do repairs and a bit of rehabilitation or whatever. And there are gonna be people who could do wonderful things with boat design and boat building but we'll never get to know necessarily because it's not economically feasible. With a rowboat or one that you can scull, you can get up into the little bays and creeks, see the turtles, appreciate the surroundings and the green herons and the yellow crowned night herons. You see fish and whatnot, and it's a matter of appreciating and enjoying our environment. And the watercraft, in my view, give you that tool you need to get there. And it would be nice from our heritage point of view if more interest could be swung back into craft and getting people to slow down and just appreciate what's going on. You're out in the water, you've got the elements, the wind and the tides to work with, or they can work against you if you want, but you have to cooperate with some things. I don't think you can fight the march of time or whatever you want to call it. You can't turn back the clock. So there's a whole art and craft out there that we may not really see anymore. 
and a lot of Bermudians still live that life. Even if they work in a vehicle or a building during the day, they spend as much time as they can in their boats. You know, um, most of them came from families that were involved in this way of living. And I think it's a reminder that really at the end of the day, all we have is our own resourcefulness. Because if Bermudians aren't resourceful, we wouldn't be here. We, we simply wouldn't be here. It'd just be a rock. <laughs> what I also find fascinating, getting the boat in, into her element and watching her, uh, whether it be a, a water or from another boat, and seeing how she takes the waves and her sail, how well she fits the water and moves through the water, how she handles and goes about. If it's a rowboat, you want to see how well she rows, how she carries between strokes. If you have everything in harmony, it's uh, a pleasure to row. If something's out of whack, it's work. You know, whether it be racing in, in seagulls or rowing with another boat or aboard a boat, it's lovely when you can get the boat in harmony with the seas and literally dancing over the waves or through them. And getting her out in different weathers, seeing how she performs and behaves and learn her weaknesses and her strengths. And in a way it becomes a living thing and is moving you more than physically. sing and dance all the way from Somerset to St. Jude. They used to sing and dance as they went along singing a happy but a teasing kind of song what they singing man they go like all the way from Monroe that's where all the old maids stay All the way to crawl inside Nothing there but foolish pride What you say? Man? point half a gallon and half a pint all the way to Devonshire Point brackish water and rotten corn man you say that's funny man they used to sing and dance as they went along yes singing a happy but a teasing kind of song Ha ha ha, yeah man <laughs> <laughs>